Hello. Hi. Welcome to our virtual fireside chat. Um, I am your host, Norma. And if you've never been to a Zoom web webinar before, please submit your questions and answers via the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen or um, the chat. Uh, put any comments you would like in the chat box. Um, and if you miss anything, this will be recorded and it will be on our YouTube video. Um, so we have two very dynamic guests here today. I'm so excited. Um, but before we introduce them, I would like to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Norma Kumpian, and I am a formerly incarcerated uh, woman of color. I am Latina first generation, and I spent 18 years in prison, mostly at the California Institution for Women, but also at the Central California Women's Facility. I spent about two years in the Los Angeles County Jail, and six months of that time, I was pregnant with my son. So I know firsthand the trauma and shame, guilt, and depression that comes hand in hand with incarceration, um, especially for women. Um, but I can also give testament to <clears throat> beautiful, compassionate, and resilient women who surrounded me during my time, who gave me love and gave me support when I couldn't really give it to myself. So, the reason that I'm here in this space is because of so many women, so many strong women who saw something else in me when I couldn't for myself. Um, and they taught me to look for and to build community. So understanding these things and, and those principles and everything that I went through really enables me in my position as the Women and Non-Binary Services Program Manager to develop programs for our women and our non-binary folks um, that really um, speaks to them. So currently what we're doing here at ARC is we're holding a couple Zoom meetings a week, um, providing supportive services that way. We're, we've also teamed up with a new way of life. If they're watching, they know that what this is about. Um, and we can't go into the prisons right now. We usually go into both of the largest prisons, CIW and CCWF. Um, so we've reached out via mail. We're doing a mailing to CIW and our SAC women's team is sending out their mailing to Chowchilla next week. So um, although these are difficult times, we, do, we stand with our people inside and out. And speaking of strong people, we have two very strong women here with us today, and we're going to have a conversation with them. But first, let me introduce you to both Assembly Member Sydney Kumlager is here, and also Miss Su Susan Burton. So let me start with Assembly Member Kumlager. Um, she represents the 54th Assembly District, encompassing Baldwin Hills, the Crenshaw community, all of Culver City, Ladera Heights, Lamert Park. Mar Vista, Mid City Los Angeles, Palms, Pico Union, Westwood, and Windsor Hills. In 2019, she guided six of her eight bills to the governor's desk, all of which were signed into law. Most notable among them were Assembly Bill 241 and 242, incorporating implicit bias training into continued education for healthcare professionals, lawyers, and judges respectfully, respectively. Kamlager recognizes that injustice in the form of implicit bias is inherent in our health and judicial systems, and that the decisions made by healthcare and judicial professionals have the power to alter lives significantly. Both these bills were victories in the pursuit of reducing disparities in California's healthcare and judicial systems. As chair of the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women, um, she is focused on reviewing and reforming policies to support the health, the dignity, and rehabilitation of women in prison. Kamlager also serves on the Penal Code Revision Committee, 
the committee directed by Governor Gavin Newsom studies and recommends ways to simplify and rationalize the substance and procedure of criminal law in California. She also sits on the Assembly uh, Public Safety Committee. She was born and raised in Chicago and moved to LA to attend USC, where she earned a bachelor's degree in political science and joined Zeta Phi Beta Sorority. She earned her master's degree in arts management and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University. Com uh, Assembly member Com Lager lives in View Park with her husband, Austin Dove, her two stepchildren, and their dog, Kush, where <laughs> she enjoys staying home and washing her hands. Um, <laughs> Miss <laughs> Susan Burton is also here with us today. Many of you may recognize her. She founded a New Way of Life Reentry Project in 1998 to help women affected by the problems of incarceration and addiction with compassionate, practical support and resources. The organization has helped thousands of families in California and around the country. And Susan herself has been widely recognized as a new civil rights leader and social change activist. Her memoir, Becoming Miss Burton, received a 2018 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work. Recently, Susan launched the Sisterhood Alliance for Freedom and Equality Housing Network, a replic replication model that will allow a new way of life to share its methods with other up and coming reentry housing programs throughout the country. So thank you both so much for joining us today, this beautiful afternoon. And um, I really wanna just start off by just hearing how you both are just personally. Just this is a really rough time for all of us and I would just wanna hear um, assembly member um, Kam Lager, how are you personally during this, this health crisis? Um, well, first I wanna say uh, thank you to uh, you, Norma, and um, to Susan, and to ARC, and to our Facebook Live family for joining us on this beautiful Friday um, at noon for this conversation with some beautiful and serious and activated women. Um, so thank you, and thank you for the invitation. You know, I woke up this morning, and for the first time in a while, I meditated and realized that um, I have not been, my equilibrium has been off. Um, I've noticed that, you know, we're either Zooming constantly or on conference calls constantly or talking with folks constantly. And because we are sheltering at home, people, including ourselves, think that um, we can just tap into work 24-7. And I think under traditional circumstances, even though I'm sure all of us are women on the go working constantly, you still figure out ways to insert some personal or some quality time. If it's going to the hairdresser or if it's taking a long bath or whatever it is that we do. And I feel like um, those routines have been a little sidetracked. And so I woke up this morning and I realized that my equilibrium had been off and that I have not been practicing self-care in the way that I am telling my staff to do so and in the way that I'm asking my constituents to do so. Okay. Um, yes, I, I hear that. I miss those uh, walks to my, my colleagues' desks and the water cooler talk. I really miss those moments also. Um, I started calling my cat my colleague. So see if that will help me a little bit, but she's, yeah. Um, Miss, Miss Susan, how are you? How are you feeling? Um, so um, I'm well, Norma. Uh, life has really, really, really changed. Um, um, I find myself thinking about the moment that we are in. And although it is a pandemic crisis moment, I see it also as a moment to really insert change uh, and to do some, um, I guess I, I think about, you know, courageous things that would allow for uh, people to have a sense of uh, dignity 
and opportunity, not to mention safety, health and safety. So I want to thank, thank the uh, assembly member, assembly member Kalmiger. Uh, I want to thank you, Norma, since you've been home, you've just been batting a thousand, just standing up and ushering people through. And I want to thank ARC for holding this virtual uh, fireside chat. Uh, I find myself just zoom, zoom, zooming all day. Yeah. And it reminds me of Lionel Richie or uh, his, his song because it's got to come back around, zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> um, you know, but I uh, am really um, just, uh, you know, this has forced me to take time to just stop and to sort of rethink uh, my work, uh, rethink about what the future holds. And it's also allowed me to plant a garden I've been trying to plant for three years. Hey now, hey now. <laughs> yeah, I got greens in the backyard now, y'all. <laughs> greens, green beans. You know, squash, bell pepper, okra, eggplant. I got it going on. Ooh. Don't be shaming us, Susan. Don't be shaming us. <laughs> yeah, and invite us when this is all over. I mean, we can Hello. be six feet away, but... Uh, garden party, us. garden party. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Susan, for uh, making us all hungry. Um, <laughs> so um, assembly member, let, let me start with you. Um, so what brought you to your work in public service? Like you, I know you're the chair of the incarcerated um, uh, women's committee and what, what made you want to do that? Like of all of the, the committees, like what brought you, what brought you over here? <laughs> So um, I come from a family of folks that have done some kind of public service, teachers, social workers, uh, nurses. My, my grandmother was a nurse. Uh, she worked at a clinic that serviced the Robert Taylor Homes, uh, which is a project, uh, 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 housing project in Chicago. And so for me, I've just always been surrounded by very strong Black women who instilled in me this notion of giving back and being part of your community. Um, you know, my mother's best friends are Black Panthers, and so inherent in all of the stuff that I um, uh, had around me was this notion around social justice. And then as an adult woman um, coming here and being in Los Angeles during the time of the riots and during the time of the earthquake, the Northridge earthquake, <laughs> you see how important um, public service is, and then working for a sister, a great sister like Senator Mitchell and, and helping her with her campaign into the assembly and in the Senate. And then in that job as a district director, meeting fabulous women like Susan Burton who say, come and take a tour at CIW so that you can really see what's happening to women on the inside. So that's been my trajectory here. Um, and the reason why I asked to chair the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women is Twofold, I sit on public safety and um, you know, every Tuesday morning at nine o'clock, folks come in with these budget proposals or these legislative proposals rather. And it's always about creating more time on the books. It's about enhancing the penal code. Um, you know, going from five years to eight, mandatory minimums, a sentence enhancements, um, opportunities for solitary confinement. And I noticed that in all of the conversations, the, uh, the, career, the criminal that people have in mind is a black man or brown man. And so I think that that erases the compassion and the understanding and the nuance that comes with conversations around incarceration. We're not talking about reunification of families. We're not talking about personal care products and hygiene. We're not talking about sexual trauma. And those are issues that are specific oftentimes to women and what women are dealing with when they're going into the system. And so I wanted to create a space just for women to be able to talk about their experiences and to force us to hear your voices. And hopefully in doing so, we will come to public safety with a little more compassion. And then my second hope is that we can use this as a Trojan horse to also talk about our black and brown men who are routinely thrown under the bus. 
And if you can insert some compassion in how you think about the lives and the experiences of women, then how come you cannot transfer that over to how you see everyone, including our black and brown men? Um, yes, wow, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely, thank you. Um, and Ms. Susan, how are, how are the women at A New Way of Life? And I, I know your story, I actually, I've read your book, but I know your story also, but I don't know if all of our listeners here today know it. So could you tell us a little bit about what uh, brought you to, the, to open up your first home? Yeah, so um, I'll go all the way back and, and talk about um, my son being killed by a detective. And as a result of his death, I just didn't know how to cope with it. And I drank and it escalated to drug use and I was in prison. And, you know, I just want to uh, ground this conversation in the fact that women are the fastest growing segment of the criminal justice system. And I was a part of that. Norma, you were a part of that. Um, and so for my drug use, I was incarcerated. And I was incarcerated over and over again. And then I found help. I found help in an upscale community where people um, were not incarcerated for uh, things that they were incar incarcerated for, like drug use in South LA or drug possession. And when I found this place, I got on a, um, a trajectory to healing and I started a new way of life. And now a new way of life stands poised position to support women coming home from incarceration. And when we think right now in this time about women who are incarcerated, <clears throat> And the health threat within the the health threat within the uh, um, jails and the prisons, um, and I think about you know how can we get, or better yet, when will we get some of those people released back into community? So I started a new way of life based on my own experience. And as you stated, thousands of, of people have, women have been through a new way of life. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we want to be a part of, of getting people out of the prisons, out of the jails, out of harm's way, back into the community in a way that um, allows them to become the best that they can be. And yep. uh, supports the the health and the safety of our community. I see this time right now as a time that we can really reframe criminal justice around health and safety, not safety in the in the terms of uh, LAPD or the sheriff's department, but safety in a way that. Um, uh, 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 supports communities, community re reunification, uh, safety as in, in having victim services and safety is having, you know, employment, safety is having uh, uh, children with their parents, but a whole new shift. And I think right now, right now is a time that we can do this both at a community level and at a, a state legislature level. So I'm calling on you right now, uh, Assembly <laughs> Member Calvary. I hear you. you. Know, I hear you. You yes. have created this select committee and you have toured the prisons and jails. And you do see that, you know, uh, historically, we've been over the top with punishment. And, and 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 under and under with opportunity. So this pandemic has pushed us in a way that we can really be recreative and thinking about, you know, how we move forward and when we move. I know there's a lot of talk about releases, but it's been talk. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I've I've, I've, I've contacted service providers uh, who have beds open. I've submitted a list to the Office of Diversion and Reentry locally. 
to say these are women who are asking for help and can they be in the slated for release? You know, I have placement for them. I have support for them. Uh, I was on a call with the, um, with the Secretary of Corrections uh, last week and I inserted myself to say that, you know, if it's the will of CDCR to create an infrastructure, to, to create opportunities for contracting, then all they have to do in their contract department is lower the bar and push out grants, push out, push out contracts for providers to provide housing for those 3,500 people that they're talking about releasing. And I emphasize just talking about it. That it hasn't happened. And you know, I mean, this is the time to, I think, take action and be forward thinking and, and creative in our approach. We can't do things the way we've been doing them. Mm. It hasn't worked. It mm. isn't working. And this right now is the time, I think, to just step up and step out. You know, I, I want to end this with saying this. One of our longtime uh, supporters uh, sent me an email last week and said, all of these people I hear are getting released. I want to get you another house to help. Mm. So, so, so he said, so I called him and said that was so thoughtful of him. Mm. And then what he said to me, can you do it? And I said, yes, I can do it. Even in a pandemic, I can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, okay, mm -hmm. the check is in the mail. Mm. So this is the way the community is also thinking and looking about at this because it, this is serious, not only for those incarcerated, but for our guards and our, our law enforcement and whatever, it's serious, but the prisoners have no choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry. I went on a rant. No, I loved it. I loved it. I love how like we're in a pandemic and you're like getting a house. Like that's like so <laughs> Susan Burton. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm all like in a ball, like some days, like, oh, and Susan, Susan Burton got a new house. Mm -hmm. um, but, but talking about that, I know just talking to you guys um, on here, I kind of um, really just got into hearing your words and I almost forgot for a minute about what we're going through right now with this, uh, the coronavirus and the COVID-19. Um, um, just cause it's just good to be in this space with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, but bringing it back, um, assembly member, um, could you share with us maybe some some thoughts from the legislator as far as like the safety measures for people who are incarcerated and then also for the public too? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you recall, I don't know if it was a couple of years ago, there was a um, measles outbreak um, in the jails and our brothers and sisters who were incarcerated were uh, in quarantine lockdown for 24 hours a day, um, not able to get out, not able to walk around, not able to have any of the freedoms that they have um, while they are incarcerated. And so this pandemic um, is 10 times, tenfold the experiences. And I have talked to some folks who went through that who said, um, whatever you do, please don't ask them to quarantine us because I, I will go crazy because there's nothing worse than having a guard slide a um, eye tablet or some electronic device through the hole to say this is what has to keep you company for 24 hours for days at a time. And so we have to move beyond um, A, our, our very draconian sense of what punishment and rehabilitation and penance and sentencing looks like. We have to continue to be forced to talk about the dehuman, dehumanization that happens in our jails and in our prisons. And we have to be honest enough to say that it's happening to folks who are living incarcerated, living behind bars, and it's also happening to folks who are working in those systems, 
who I yeah. believe during the course of time also lose their sense of humanity because you have folks that are on either the same tier or maybe one step above or below who are asked to become gladiators in a sense and kill or be killed spiritually, physically, psychologically. And I always ask this question, what do you think you are going to get from a person once they are released? If while they have been incarcerated, this is the landscape that you are forcing them in which to live. Shame on you. And then shame on you for wondering why recidivism rates are the numbers that they are because we totally have taken the R out of CDCR. And we have created this very insidious pipeline with our jail into prison systems where no one is really capacitated to deal with the mental and the physical health of folks who are working and living behind bars. So maybe that's my rant. As it relates to COVID, I have to tell you, we've been ricocheting. Um, and I think that folks began to take, um, folks who are incarcerated, uh, being infected by COVID-19 much more seriously when people started testing positive. And I know that the reason why they're testing positive is because of the guards, because of the folks who are coming in and out. Folks who are on the inside, how are they getting it? They're not touching folks on the outside. So I always wonder why we start to sort of look at things with a little more humanity when it's when it's only impacting those that are working in the system and not those who are living in the system. In the very beginning, courts were continuing to work as usual. And then um, we started hearing about concerns that judges and bailiffs and counselors were having. And so then we began to restrict access to some of the courts. Then miraculously, our chief justice said, um, hey, low-level offenders uh, or folks with low-level offenses um, should be released. Uh, juveniles should be released. Um, if you only have maybe 60 days left, you should be released. Um, you can now have telephonic and video conference um, hearings or conversations with your counsel instead of what we were doing before. So, um, Shortly after people re recognized the significance and the impact of COVID-19, those were measures that we enacted. Then the Sheriff's Department here in LA um, released, I think about 10% of its population. Uh, but there is a concern about making sure that now that folks are out, that they have access to resources like uh, the kinds of resources that Susan offers and knows folks need. But then I think a week ago, Judicial Council had an emergency meeting and they have curtailed speedy trials. So now what that means is folks who are, they have curtailed speedy trials for 90 days after the emergency. So now what that means is folks who are in um, jails, especially in ones where you see high rates of suicide and death and, and mistreatment happening, like in Alameda, like in LA and other places, will be forced to stay in custody 90 days beyond when they would have access to a trial. So we are actually seeing a ricocheting effect in terms of criminal justice. Initially, it was about getting folks out because we don't want folks that don't need to be there or on the way, or, you know, or um, on the verge of getting out. We don't want them uh, to be confined where they could increase their risk of infection. And now we're seeing this like stop and hold everyone mm -hmm. and from the community who's saying, well, we don't want all of these folks getting out when they shouldn't be. You're impacting our public safety. And so the pendulum has started to swing. And so we as advocates and legislators have to be really vigilant about reminding folks that they cannot talk out of both sides of their mouth. Hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's just so real. And when I think about uh, trials being postponed nine days, I think about all of those people who are assume, presumed innocent, but can't make their bail, that are being held and just cannot make their bail. Uh, I mean, this is, I, I'm just sitting here and I don't know if y'all can see the smoke coming out of my head, but it's rising, sister, it is rising. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, um, I got a call last week 
from the uh, um, Office of Diversion asking if we would transport people from the jails. And I didn't hesitate, yes, we will. We will transport people. They said they had the medical equipment, but nothing's moving. And while nothing moving, I'm sure COVID is. Uh, I'm sure it's moving. And so, um, you know, we just stand ready to support and assist uh, getting people not only to freedom, but to an op to a, a life opportunity. Um, I'm sure that, uh, be it that the steps are taking, uh, we both advocates and service providers uh, will step up to make sure that the best the the, be the best opportunities are available. Are there are opportunities available for? housing and safety. But we need, um, we, need, um, we need people to pull the lever and open the gates and to allow us the opportunity to show up uh, for that community. And let's be clear, bail should be connected to statutory offenses. It should not be connected to someone's financial ability to pay. That's what it's connected to. I know. <laughs> and this poor is people. why that's right. Poor and, people are 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 laying in there trying to fight their cases and are stalled three months. You know, just to think about will they make be a death sentence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, will that two year conviction for uh, writing a bad check be a death sentence? Will that mother who stole, uh, will that offense be a death sentence? Um, I mean, we got it so backwards here. We got weird, you know, I don't know. And to um, bring it back to COVID, Norma, um, to your point, you know, what happens when folks who are incarcerated um, do test positive? You know, Susan, both of you can speak from personal knowledge of, of knowing what it's like to have to seek medical care while you are incarcerated. I've certainly seen some of it when I've taken tours and the, the, the facility that I visited, they did not have a nurse and a doctor on call 24 hours a day. So how are you quarantining folks with compassion? You know, those are questions that my office has been asking um, because you, you, this is the time when you up the ante on humanity and compassion. Yeah, and so we need the sheriff. We need the sheriff to come forth and uh, let us know just what's going on. Um, just before we went on this lockdown, I was in the, in the uh, CRDF doing an inspection. Uh, myself and Dr. Grill, we were assigned to the Civil Brand Commission. And at that point, the sheriffs had no, the, the deputies had no directive around COVID and I looked over and this woman was just really, really coughing, coughing and I asked the deputy, what is, what do you do for that? Mm -hmm. What are you mm -hmm. doing? Uh, uh, what, what's the directive around this? This is serious. And at that point, early on, they had none and I'm sure they do now, but we need to hear from the sheriff what his plans are. What is he doing uh, when people are tested a positive? How many sheriffs have, te have tested positive? Um, when are the releases going to happen? How is he coordinating with the community? What are the needs that he can use from the community to assist, to assist him? Because I'm sure it's overwhelming even for him. But, but we are here. But we need to hear uh, from the sheriff. We're seeing the mayor. We're seeing the governor. We're seeing uh, the legislator let legislature come up and do conversations. We need one with the share. Uh, he needs to inform us of what he's doing. One of the things that I know uh, my colleagues and I have also pressed for 
is um, a prohibition on um, uh, charging folks with low level offenses right now. Because we know that uh, a number of reasons why women actually find themselves touched by the incarceration system is because of uh, low level offenses. You know, you're stealing drugs, leaving your children home. And I'm concerned that uh, we will see as a result of this pandemic, folks acting out of desperation and anxiety as it relates to their own poverty and what they're trying to do to stay sane and to stay alive and to survive with their kids. And we know that oftentimes under duress and stress that people make bad decisions or fall into some bad circumstances. And so I am in not interested at all in seeing a spike in those kinds of arrests and charges as a result of folks trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with COVID-19. Um, this is not the time to become a nanny state. And um, have you have you heard or do you know how they will be releasing the 3,500? Is it just going through people's see files and seeing when um, their releases are and then doing it that way. So give, so that's know. what we've been told. We've been told that um, that folks will be, a lot of it is in consultation with counsel. And so um, I've, I've heard that um, DAs are sharing information, mostly with public defenders, um, but more and more now with folks that have have um, some kind of private defense, looking at release dates, um, assessing why they're in there and if it's because of a bail situation um, that can be um, alleviated at this time. And so it is a trickle down um, or a trickling effect in terms of releasing. But we do, we, we have been told that folks are looking at the release dates as the primary um, reason for when folks will get out. I've also been told, because we've talked with, um, I've been talking with judges and some prosecutors, that um, now DAs are being a little more pragmatic, you know, about, hey, mm. is this something that we really need to focus on? Do I need to double down on this case? And so, you know, it makes you question why now all of a sudden are you having a, a come to Jesus about um, the work that you're doing? Um, and can you continue this frame of thought post-COVID. Mm. Because what we also see is we've completely overburdened these systems, which we've all been saying for years and years. Yeah. I Part of what is really frustrating to me, and I know a lot of, a lot of us that are formerly incarcerated talk about it, is the way that it's a lot of things are bypassed for people that are termed violent. So a lot of people that have done a lot of hard work inside have really worked on themselves um, and done, you know, a lot of groups, a lot of therapy, a lot of insight, a lot of digging deep that they're often excluded from moments like this. And, um, you know, some of the things that are deemed like violent are, are really just their, their circumstances. I'm sure I know I don't have to tell the two of you that, but they're just yeah. circumstances where you, you know, one example is uh, people that are struggling would go into someone's garage. They're, you know, on uh, drugs or whatever, and they go into someone's garage and that's considered something, in most cases, that's considered violent because you went into mm -hmm. someone's property that could, you know, whatever. And so that part, I think, for, for our people out here is really frustrating because um, we think that you to look at the whole person, not just things that are called low level and things that are called <laughs> violent. Well, so. let's also be clear. That's only happening to certain groups that look, that have certain melanin in their skin. Because, you know, you also have to talk about who, who are the groups that are actually being monitored, you know, and the difference between having law enforcement come and check on you and say, you know, hello, Sally, are you okay? Is this where you should be? You know, can I help you versus, <laughs> you know, the shakedown and then let me put you in the car because you look like you have absolutely no business being where you are. So let's also make sure that we insert race and poverty and gender and trans into those conversations about how that happens. That's why the majority of the people look like they do in our jails and prisons. You know, Sydney, uh, Norma brings up a really, really good point. And I've seen this um, uh, over the decades. You know, 
I mean, at this at this moment right here, the governor has the ability to put together a a Zoom board hearing and have those folks that are older and aging and vulnerable inside of the prisons review their cases and the work that they've done on themselves and and do some releases and those that have been found suitable already why aren't they why haven't their releases been expedited mm -hmm. you know i mean if you're saying that you're going to lower the prison to lower the infection rate of COVID. those that have already been found suitable could have expedited paperwork instead of waiting 120 days or or 90 days uh after the board of prison terms have found you suitable and not a threat to society and those people are not being released mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know they they pose no threat they've been found suitable but the other thing that could happen is that uh, 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 the, the Board of Prison Terms can come together on a Zoom call like we're doing right now mm -hmm. and hold a hearing and go through those cases that have, have, have did all the rehabilitation and all the work. Because I know those women come home ready to engage. Oh. Mm -hmm. They have worked on themselves. Mm -hmm. They are well, we, model, they're not only model residents, they're model citizens. Mm -hmm. But that could be a trail of folks that come home. Well, so, you know, the governor, I think, um, expedited the release of 21 state prisoners maybe a week or so ago. Many of them were older. They all done their time. Um, I think one of the brothers that got released had participated in ear hustle and one one of the reasons why he said they expedited the release was because they wanted to get folks who had served their time um, out before there was a spike in um, infections in the state prison. But Susan, you, you raise a good point. I mean, there have been so many recent articles on parole hearings and that board and the lack of transparency. And in my mind, um, how folks kind of judge what remorse and rehabilitation looks like who absolutely have no idea into the lives and experiences of the folks um, who are incarcerated. And so how do you reform that system? Um, and then the general lack of transparency. I, right before all of this happened, got um, a JLAC, Joint Legislative Audit uh, Committee request through that will audit the jails in Alameda, Fresno, and Los Angeles County because we have to know what's going on in these systems and what's happening um, with the money. But to your point about expediting releases, how long is enough time? Yeah. You know, uh, if you have someone in prison forever, then why are you talking about rehabilitation? Because how I want to, to be with these people when they come out so that we can once again collaborate on life and a future. So you have to have conversations about that, about the length of time that is disproportionate and that is inordinate and is completely contrary to what we talk about when we're trying to create humane, Civil this is the only nation. Society. This is the only nation that punishes people to the to the punish the punishes literally punishes the life out of them mm -hmm. way beyond uh, uh, the period that they rehabilitated. I have one woman uh, who came to a new way of life about two months ago, and she was in prison thirty seven years. You know, but I've been to Norway. I've been to Sweden. I have saw what they do. Mm -hmm, I saw mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. intention of, is rehabilitation, mm -hmm. not punishment. So right. there are models out there. There are things that we can do. And I think during this period mm -hmm. is a period that we can actually move to really change uh, mm -hmm. how we operate in this nation around incarceration um, and punishment and, also at, and, and crime. At, yes. And, and expediting probation. And, and the racism within the system. I mean, also what I noted in those other countries, though, is that uh, all of the people are white. 
you know, <laughs> there's not black folks in there. Uh, so, well, and the ones and the ones who are immigrants get a uh, longer sentence. Uh, yeah, they, they I saw a couple. Access. I saw a couple. Yeah. So, so um, the the bias training that you're doing is something that's really really good. Uh, but you know, um, I mean, beyond you know, beyond that, right now, we just need to be pushing. We need to stand ready and be able to um, do something different. Mm -hmm. and um, advance the humanity of people and the opportunity of people. And also Black how people. we think about, yes, people. yes, poor people. Poor people. And how we um, change probation and expedite that time um, to make sure that folks who, um, because of COVID, might be struggling to make their appointments or to do the things that they would normally be doing while they're on probation, making sure that there's some leniency created into those systems. Because A, I think we already keep folks on probation far too long. I have said this time and time again, I'm going to make a mistake in five years. Trust and believe. Um, you know, and so I, you know, yeah. Sure. Uh, when you thought, think about probation, you think about other county systems. So we have women who are in the process of reuniting with their children and all visitation has stopped. Mm -hmm. But you know what hasn't stopped? They have to go and test every week. Their number comes up. And in this time of sheltering in place, and by the way, we have all our homes, the women are sheltering in place. We're making sure all their needs are met, all their phone bills are paid, all of the stuff that, that keeps their lives going, uh, that, that, they don't fall, that it doesn't fall apart. So we're not letting them get on public transportation. We're making sure they're safe. Just like you're making sure you're safe, I'm making sure I'm safe. Those women need to be able to be made safe also. But do you know DCFS has the nerve to continue to have them go down and urinate in a cup in order not to defy the orders of, uh, of, of, of their reunification plan? And I'm like, really? Now, that's, that's the agency that is being exposed. That's the women who are having to go out and be exposed. And they go into this room where there's a lot of people sitting around waiting mm -hmm. for their turn to test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, some stuff just doesn't stop. I'm like, really, DCFS? Right. Um, I mean, outrageous. I have been taking notes on that one. I, I mean, see you have. Yeah. <laughs> because we've been, we've been, we've been, we've been having these meetings with the county uh, officials and we've also been talking, obviously, I've been talking to folks at the state level, um, but it's always good to get this additional information so that I can make my stick even longer. Um, you know, yeah, DCF, DCFS needs to stop yeah. having <laughs> people but, transport to go and meet a test during this time when when the buses are off track. Uh, the but when you're being asked to shelter at home. House, but you say yeah. you better be if you want your yeah. baby back. Or you if, you know, this or, test. or if you have employment that has now become shaky. And if you're if, and for many folks, uh, what's a priority is making sure that they're either to, able to pay their rent or to get their food or to do those things that will keep them whole. And so you have to make you have to create some flexibility, especially <coughs> during this time in making sure that folks are able to do that rather than always thinking about the man who's waiting with a little pad and a pencil to dock mm -hmm. you and, and and keep you from seeing your kids or getting reunified or, or yeah. checking time off the books. And, and, and then don't stop once COVID is over. Recognize yep. that these work, that these policies can in fact work and are more humane and then yeah. institute them permanently. And that's our job to call the county to question and say, hello, use this as a learning opportunity. Yeah. Hello state, use this as a learning opportunity. Hello judicial council, Stop acting like the Trump administration because the emergency measures that came from the Judicial Council over the weekend are the same policies that the Trump administration was trying to push at the federal level. 
curtailing speedy trials and keeping you locked up for 90 days after the emergency is over. Shame on California. Shame on you. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so we also, we have something um, here that is uh, a special treat. We have some words from one of the women on the inside. Um, we're talking about them. We all, all of us have such a passion for our sisters inside. Um, assembly member, I think you have her letter that she yes. wanted to share with us. So I'm so excited. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. We are getting to use the recreation yard and circle. The day rooms are now closed, except to make phone calls, take showers, send emails, and do laundry. Global Tel Link offered free phone calls for April on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now the problem with this is that we only have two phones. And for example, tonight I had to make a call at 7.30 p.m. and the phones were not working. There are not even enough phone slots for everyone to get two calls a day. Apparently they were supposed to put in another phone yet this has not happened, even though it was approved. So you can let them know that and maybe someone can get a phone put in. What would be great is a type of Skype with our children or now with elderly family members. I know it can't cost that much to get a computer and a camera and especially how long we are going to go without visits. My proposal was to do homework with our kids via a type of Skype as I do on the telephone, as it is sometimes difficult in 15 minutes. What I think is really worth mentioning to the assembly member, and I hear you sister, I hear you, <laughs> is given that we know this system is broken, the large amount of elderly inmates and the cost to care for them. God forbid we get COVID-19 in here. I don't want to even imagine. Many of the sick and elderly are very frightened. The state's job is to keep us safe and I don't know how this will happen. I have been limiting how often I go to the chow hall, but many have to go as they have no other food source. I think there are many women. At least I have been going doing the right thing and even if people had to be released on ankle monitors, I think a program could be established. After being in the system now almost 11 years, I truly believe people can change. And if this is the person's first and only crime, I really think a system could be developed not only for now, but in the future to better evaluate inmates who could be released and have very little chance of returning. I have ideas if anyone is interested. <laughs> But we're all interested, sister. Thank you for sharing your note and allowing me to read it. And Norma and Susan and I and so many on this call and with Facebook Live, we are interested. We are interested in you and we are interested in what you've said. Thank you so much for reading that and <clears throat> for sharing that, um, those words with us. Um, uh, yeah. It really touched me. I know how how scared I am on some days out here, and to have people be in control of my every movement in there. Um, yeah, I'm really worried about it. Um, yeah, to be there with no protection, no uh ability to communicate and and you know i mean we have phone calls free phone calls on some days you know as much as global tail linkedin made they can make free phone calls every day but that is not a solution that is just uh, 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 uh something through the moment you know so and we've uh, tried in the past i mean i've only been on public safety for a year and a half now we've seen Legis um, legislation come to cut back on the costs of the calls because we know that it's just financially disastrous and prohibitive for folks. Um, yeah. And so we have to keep pushing on that. And, and we know that you have to marry um, um, safety, uh, medical safety and health safety during this time 
um, with yeah. kind of managing these systems. Yeah. But you can still integrate compassion into all of that. Yes, um, you can. Because these are women with families, with lives, with children and mothers. And regardless of where you're living, um, you are connected to people or you're yeah. wanting to be connected to people. Yeah. And we have to embrace that and reaffirm that. Yeah. So, um, it's been lovely. It's been lovely talking to you, Norma and uh, Sydney, and it's hopeful. Um, I, I, you know, um, after that letter, my heart is just like full and aching. Uh, I mean, there's just so much more we could do uh, with uh, extending um, human dignity and compassion to people. It's just so much more we can do. And, and we all should be able to access, uh, be able to treat each other with dignity and compassion. I mean, it just, it doesn't cost us anything to do that, nothing. And we get more, believe me, yep. we get more when we spend it like that. Were there, were there any questions, uh, Norma? Uh, well, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, so every time I go to look at the question, you see my big paw. So I think um, we might just have to end with some uh, parting words from the both of you. So if you guys have some last words about, um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I can't believe it's been an hour. Uh, I feel like we just had kind of like lunch together and we are barely getting our uh, main course. But um, I love being on here with you guys. I just wanted to give you guys space to both have some parting words. Um, I don't know who, yeah, who wants to go. So, um, people who are on the chat, if there are folks that have uh, the ability to provide space for people coming home, could they just, um, message into the chat and Norma, if you could help me to get those messages so we could count whether it's women or men's beds and what the capacity and availability is and what people are able and willing to do. Um, you know, I'm raising funds now that would allow me to give each person uh, from the county level uh, a, a hundred dollar gift card to get the essential that they need, that they're not just running out trying to do it by any means necessary. Um, and then I just want to thank ARC. I want to thank uh, uh, Sydney and thank everybody that actually tuned in to uh, be a part of this fireside chat. I'm going to leave here and call the realtor to find a house. <laughs> there are probably a lot on the market now yeah one more house yeah yeah so i um also want to thank um arc and once again um send my love and my heart to susan <coughs> and norma and all the folks who uh, joined us during this 12 o'clock hour i want to offer my website because i've been following a lot of the chat um and so my website is a54 dot asmdc.org and we have a tab on there on all things COVID, everything from employment to what's happening with the prison systems um, to helping folks with small business to some of the emergency grant and disaster relief programs that are available and obviously tips on how to stay um, safe and healthy during this time. So that's a54.asmdc org. Um, and just my parting comment is I hope this encourages us to think about what thriving and what survival means. And it's one thing to kind of survive through a pandemic and to not get sick, but it's another thing to think about a collective survival and what that means for all of us in the communities and the neighborhoods and the systems that we want to live in and that we want to own. Um, and we should never be supportive of systems 
um, that are about punishing and breaking the spirit and the body of our people. And mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to rise from this and to redefine what survival means for so many of us, the ones that continue to be overlooked and marginalized and are just used as sound bites and rhetoric and not really seen as people. And the sister whose note I read, she is a real person. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Sydney. I'd like to also offer up my website. Uh, it's a new way of life dot org um yeah uh, a new way of life dot org and folks can reach the information tab there uh and again just thank you so so much um so we have to we have to circle back and figure out what kind of push we can do uh with each other uh, uh by joining forces thanks you guys so much and if you're out out there listening and if you can donate please do either to assemblywoman's uh com loggers uh website or a new way of life.org or anti-recidivism.org and i want to thank these two strong beautiful women for being here today and i my parting words are that um i've been in a place before where i struggled to see the light and what helped me to see the light is this. Women, strong women, coming together, helping each other up, sticking by each other, and doing what's right. So thank you, ladies, for your conversation today. And soon we will have uh, food in our conversation, and we will sit together, and we will hug. And it will, that day will come, ladies. And so when that, when that day comes, we'll celebrate again. And we'll post pictures of us hugging. So until right. then, until then, all right. see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you.